Alright, uh, can everyone hear me? Am I speaking loud enough? For everyone? Awesome. Uh, so, I wanted to give a presentation this month on uh, some stuff that I was kind of playing around with, just uh, mucking around with. Uh, it's really like a demo heavy, kind of goofy talk, it's not really serious. Uh, but yeah, the, talk, the name of the talk is Monkeying with Memory. Uh, the motivation I had is I ran across this uh, monkey patching library for Go. And immediately, like, the thing that jumped to mind is like, how do you monkey patch in Go? There's no, like, way of intercepting or indirect, uh, redirecting, like, function calls. How do you monkey patch functions in Go? Uh, the first thing that came to mind is like, well, since we're doing call instructions directly to where the functions are located in memory, you have to be actually modifying, like, the function's preamble or doing some type of thing where you jump out of the function and then jump back into it, uh, which seemed, like, really, like, interesting to me. So I looked into it a little bit deeper, and uh, indeed that's what the author of this library is doing. Uh, he assembles uh, his own uh, kind of uh, jump sequence and uh, jumps out of the function, and then obviously like writing directly to the function body is going to clobber the instructions that exist in the function body that are necessary for that function to run. So he has in the library uh, the ability to you know, repatch out those instructions so he saves them all for you. Uh, so it's a really interesting library. I'm not going to be going into detail of like how the library works or any of the features of the library, but if you want more information, it's just uh, at that GitHub URL there. Uh, so, looking into this library, kind of piqued my curiosity, I kind of felt like this would be a good tool to expose to people to explain some of Go's implementation details and possibly explain some of the common like quirks that trip up users, uh, you know, just by explaining the memory layout, it kind of explains, gives you a, a, another model of like understanding like why uh, these things exist. So. Uh, the quirks. Uh, so there's two quirks that I'm going to be addressing tonight. Uh, typed nil interfaces, where a, a nil interface is actually not nil, and uh, struct field alignment. Uh, so I'm going to demo those real quick. You might have actually ran into these yourself. I know a lot of Go programs have ran into these. Can everyone see that? Or is that too small? Is that too small? Yeah. Thanks. Is that good? Awesome. All right, so the first thing here is the typed uh, nil interface. So I'm just going to open this up. Uh, I just did a quick example here. So I, I established an interface runner has a run method. Uh, and then I have a concrete implementation of that interface foo runner. It's just a struct that has like an empty impl implementation. And then we have kind of a constructor function here that says, give me a nil foo runner. And it returns a pointer to a foo runner. And it returns a nil. Uh, you know, this is pretty basic stuff. Uh, so here we uh, instantiate that you know nil foo runner and assign it into the variable f. So you would expect the since the return value of this nil foo runner function is nil, that the variable foo would be nil as well. Uh, so we have a, a simple branching uh, scenario here where if the f, f, f is not nil, then it uh, logs not fatal, and if it is nil, then uh, everything's fine, we just exit the program. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. I'll let you uh, imagine what the uh, outcome might be for a moment. <laughs> So yeah, uh, we actually got the log that fatal. That's unexpected. So we expected f to equal nil, and it was actually nil. So what's going on here? This is confusing. The other scenario is like struct alignment. Um, I don't know who here has ran into issues with struct field alignment and go and kind of like scratched their head as to like why you have to do that in certain certain scenarios. So this might be something you run into uh, in the near future. So uh, let's open up this one. So we have two structs here, uh, type A and type B. Both of them have an identical set of fields, A, B, and C. A is an N32, which is four bytes. B is an N64, eight bytes. And C is an N32 as well, which is four bytes. Uh, so you would think that in total, this struct would require 16 bytes of memory. So down in our main here, uh, we just create a uh, zero initialized array of 100 A's and 100 B's. So you can imagine this would take about 1,600 bytes to represent this array. 
So we just print out the sizes of each. Uh, so you would imagine this prints out 1600 for both. If we run, go run main, uh, one of them's 2400, that's odd, and the other one's 1600. These are nearly identical structs, uh, the same set of fields, just the ordering of the fields changed how much memory is required for you to represent that. So that's a bit odd. Uh, what's also odd if I, is if I compile this uh, for 386, a 32-bit architecture, and I run it, they actually now both take up 1,600 bytes. So this is kind of perplexing a little bit. Uh, let's see, I have another demonstration of maybe why you might run into struct alignment issues. Uh, if you've ever used the Atomics package, there's a little caveat at the bottom of the documentation of that package that says, if you're running on a 32-bit architecture, make sure that your 64-bit uh, values that you're operating on atomically are 64-bit aligned. And when I first read that, I didn't really understand what that meant, to be honest. Uh, uh, eventually, I ran into two situations where I had to fix problems where I was using the Atomics package, running on 386 architecture, and inevitably I ran into this issue. So uh, this is just a simple demonstration. So we have the same struct uh, that we saw before, uh, where A is 32-bit uh, integer, B is 64-bit integer, C is 32-bit integer. Uh, and then in our main, we just uh, create a zero initialized A value, a struct. So this has all three fields in it. And then I just do a simple atomic add in 64 on uh, reference to that uh, B field, which is a 64 bit value. So if we run that uh, just on a 64 bit architecture, there's no problem. And indeed, if you run this on a 64 bit architecture, you'll never have problems. The problem you run into is when you inevitably, someone cross compiles your thing for 32-bit, and indeed you get a segmentation violation, uh, which is not a very helpful uh, message there. <laughs> so uh, this is kind of weird, like why does Go have this strange different behavior on different architectures? Why does the ordering of the fields matter? Uh, you know, these are the type of things I kind of wanted to explain a little bit in this talk. So keep these in mind when we uh, learn about we're accessing raw memory. Uh, these are things that we're going to address. Uh, but before we get into it, uh, a little disclaimer. These techniques are for accessing raw memory, and they are unsafe. We use the unsafe package. It's named that for a reason. Uh, they should not be used in like, real code uh, if you're doing something real, unless you really are confident in like, the implementation. Like, don't use this, these techniques in real code. Uh, this is for the demo code I have here is for educational purposes only. And remember, with great power comes great weed. <laughs> I thought this. <laughs> All right. So the unsafe package. Uh, the unsafe package contains operations that step around the type safety of Go programs. Uh, so basically, they allow you to do uh, type, do things with types similar to what you would be able to do in C. Uh, programs that use unsafe may not be portable between Go compiler versions. Uh, they might break uh, you know, your program uh, if you use unsafe, or, uh, unsafe package. Uh, additionally, unsafe has like magical behavior. I, I didn't know this before I prepared this talk, but in reading through all the documentation for unsafe, uh, there is like special magical behavior uh, when you're using stuff like syscalls. Uh, the first uh, line here, I don't know if you can read that, but we're just making a read syscall, and we pass a file descriptor into the read so it knows what to read from. And in order to pass that in, we convert it into a UNPTR. That's actually safe. Uh, and it's not the same as uh, something that might seem mathematically identical, uh, taking a UNPTR, the file descriptor, storing it in the local value PTR, and then just passing that into syscall. The difference between these two implications is the first one, the UNPTR is guaranteed to not, that, that bit of memory is guaranteed not to be deallocated or, or garbage collected uh, or moved. Uh, Go moves memory around sometimes. Uh, so if you make this install the first way, you're guaranteed that the memory is not going to move out from under you. The second one, you're not, you're not given that guarantee. So that's kind of magical behavior. Uh, just some caveats to kind of uh, be aware of. Uh, make sure to read the docs and run Go Vet. I ran into a lot of situations in preparing this talk where Go Vet was complaining, hey, you're doing this wrong. And I'm like, wow, like, it actually is telling me that there's a problem here. Uh, so yeah, just make sure to run Go Vet, and if you're using Unsafe for real things, make sure to read the docs. 
So let's get into it. Pointer types. There's two different types of pointers uh, that come along uh, with doing this type of um, unsafe memory access. The first one is unsafe pointer. Unsafe pointer is a type representing any pointer value in the uh, type system. Uh, any pointer type can be converted into an unsafe pointer, and any unsafe pointer can be converted into any pointer type. So you can take a pointer to a struct and convert it to a pointer to an end. So it's like your traditional casting in C. Uh, a reference to an unsafe pointer, if you hold on to that unsafe pointer, uh, it will keep the underlying object that it points at from being garbage collected. So that's, that's very useful if you're implementing algorithms using this type. Uh, you don't have to fight the garbage collector. Uh, the other type is UMPTR. UMPTR is an integer type that is large enough to contain the pointer size for the architecture that you're running on. Uh, any unsafe pointer can be converted to UMPTR and vice versa. And uh, references contained inside UMPTR are not given that guarantee that the garbage collector is not going to do something with it. Uh, so yeah, uh, another thing I kind of want to cover before we get into the demos is endianness. Uh, who here feels confident in describing little Nandia versus big Nandia? Is this uh, something, okay, good. Uh, so this is something that perhaps we can learn from. Uh, when I was dumping out the memory uh, on this machine, since it's AMD 64, it's a little Nandia architecture. So um, memory in the uh, Intel ecosystem, uh, 386 and AMD 64, Memory is byte addressable, so uh, you, every memory address uh, points to a single byte. Uh, naturally, you'll have data types that take up more than one byte, so the way that mem a memory is laid out um, is the lower pointer value is the least significant byte. That might, be, might seem like intuitive, yeah, like a lower value should be the least significant, uh, but when you print out representations of little endian byte sequences, like I've done here. Uh, so in this situation, if it was little endian, the 0, 0 would be the least significant, and 0, 3 would be the most significant. And with big endian, it's actually reversed. 0, 3 is the least significant, and 0, 0 is the most significant. So these are totally two different values based on how you kind of read them. So all the examples and all the stuff that we're going to be going over here is little onion. So just keep that in mind. Left hand side, that bite, even though the bite, the nibbles in the bites are most significant on the left hand side, least significant on the right hand side, the bites themselves are least significant moving over to uh, most significant. I don't know if that clarified it at all, but there you go. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna do some demos here, some primitive types. Yeah, by the way, if there's any questions or you want me to slow down or answer anything, just raise your hand. Uh, I'm more than happy to take questions. Uh, there's a lot of like demos I got here, so uh, interrupt me at any time. Are you gonna talk about why the stuff is more different later? Yeah, so that's uh, towards the end of the talk. I got some demos kind of explaining that. I got to set it up so I can knock it out there. Uh, <laughs> any other questions? No? Cool. All right, so this is a really basic program here uh, that just dumps out the memory representation of the integer. So you, you have this function raw access. I'm going to skip over that for now. We're going to come back to it very shortly. Uh, but suffice to say, the raw access function gives you raw access via a, a, a slice of bytes. Uh, so down here in our main, this is uh, most of the program. So uh, we just declare and initialize a variable x. It's an integer, and its value is g. So g is just a uh, VASCII uh, representation of an integer. Uh, we then call our raw access function. Uh, you pass in two arguments to this function. The first is an unsafe pointer that we talked about before. The other one is an unsafe size of. So uh, this raw access function needs to know how much memory to give you. Uh, so usually passing an unsafe size of will give you what you want. Uh, but you can put an arbitrary value in here. You can put 5,000, you can put 20, you can put whatever you want. Uh, just to explain what size of actually does, uh, unsafe size of will give you the size of the, uh, the type of the variable that you pass it. So in this case, we're passing it the variable x. We're saying, give me the size of that. And since x is an integer on 32-bit architectures, that would be the value of 4. This takes 4 bytes to represent a 32-bit value. On a 64-bit architecture, it would be 8. 
So it kind of depends on what architecture you're running on uh, and some other variables. Uh, but it'll give you the size of the variable that you give it. Uh, we then just dump it out, we print out the type, the address, the size of, the value of it. Uh, and then we dump out the actual memory. It says hex.dump. That's a uh, package that's built into Go. It's very useful. It's kind of like odd or OD, uh, like a Unix uh, hex dump uh, program. So you just say hex.dump, give it any slice of bytes, and it'll dump them out in a nice format. Uh, we then mutate the value that's in the zeroth index of our memory, just to kind of play around with things. In this case, I'm taking that value and I'm XORing it with space, which, if anyone knows, uh, XORing any ASCII value, ASCII character that's a, a character, like a printable character, will change the case of the character. So I'm hoping in this situation that directly accessing memory, I can mutate it to do to convert the capital G to a lowercase g. And then I just print out the mutated value. So let's go ahead and run this. And there you go. So we have our first dump there. I uh, printed out all the bytes of that type. Because we're on 64 bit, there's eight bytes. And uh, we went and mutated that byte slice, the value in the byte slice. And indeed, it actually changed the underlying uh, integer. So it's now 103 decimal or 67 hex. So that's not really that interesting, but it kind of uh, introduces you to this concept of getting access to raw, raw access to memory. So going back to that function that I originally skipped over, uh, raw access, I'm going to decompose this a little bit because this expression is quite confusing. When I ran across this in that monkey patching library, it took me a little while to figure out what's going on here. Uh, let's see, I don't know if I can bump up the contrast there a little bit. Let's zoom in. Okay, so let's take it bit by bit from the inside out. So the first thing we do is we take that unsaved pointer, and remember from before, we get cast it to any pointer of any type. So I just decided, hey, I'm going to convert it to a pointer to 255, or 255 uh, array of bytes. Uh, so that'll give me 255 uh, bytes. I then dereference that pointer, which gives me the actual array instead of a pointer to the array. I then convert that array into, into a slice, which any array, if you just do a slice notation at the end of it, it'll convert the array to a slice. Uh, and then I limit the length of the slice to the value that was passed into the function. So it's actually not that hard to understand. It is a lot of kind of like special characters in Go that you might not normally see, and a lot of syntax you might not normally see. But uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, is there any questions about that? I look at it for a little bit. Yeah. What's up? Why would you want to mess with like the the raw data? Okay. Uh, <laughs> curiosity. <laughs> uh, there, I, I imagine there are instances where you might want to have access to raw memory. Like if you're implementing something that needed compatibility with C, and you had to directly access memory to communicate with the C. Um, if you're doing direct memory manipulation. Um, if you were writing your own custom alloc here, I'm not recommending these as good ideas and go, but like there are things that you can do with this technique. Uh, one thing that I use the unsafe package for, uh, I work with a colleague at a current company to implement uh, a generic uh, type of a ring buffer. Uh, so that's one use of like the unsafe package that I've actually produced real code from. Um, but the techniques that I'm going through, like here, I don't recommend them for any real code programs. It's more just like curiosity about like how how does Go actually work under the hood? How does it represent things under the hood? And explaining kind of some of the quirks of Go. I've used it with SQL. What's any that kind of, any kind of language boundary? Like if you're just oh, I have a structure from another. Yeah, exactly. Language so to repeat, in case no one heard, the questions were, why would you use this? The answer was, don't. <laughs> and then the caveat yeah, the other, the other <laughs> person mentioned was the caveat of talking to C. Or so, so, so if you pass in the length constructor, then the length of the actual thing that's being pointed to will crash? No. You just get that access to memory. One question that you might phrase that it might change the phrasing of is like if you pass a like that's larger than an array, uh, what would happen in that situation? I don't know. I haven't tried. It. I haven't read anything that's larger than 255 bytes. But, uh, but yeah, if you pass in a like 
that is larger than the type that you, of the pointer that you gave it, it'll just give you back whatever bytes are after that. That's how I see. I would make these are zero. Yeah, most things in Go are zero allocated. Uh, this, however, though, like there could be something right next to you that is already allocated and is, has actual values. And so if you're reading the, those bytes from, from the thing that you were pointing at, you might be running into bytes that something else is pointing at. So you might get non-zero values. Try that. I haven't done that, actually, so. I'm pretty sure you can get non-zero bytes, but I haven't done that experiment yet. Any other questions? Cool. All right, so that's just like kind of a basic intro to this technique. So we're going to do some more interesting things here in a bit. So this program just does what I did with the integer with the rest of the numeric types. I was kind of curious, you know, how does Go represent these numeric types under the hood? So I just wrote this simple program that dumps integers, dumps uints, dumps float64, complex128. So let's go ahead and run that. Actually, before I run that, I'm gonna show the kind of values that I did here. So I did negative one for integer to test to make sure that it's using two's complement. That's easy to detect because two's complement would be all Fs for negative one. Uh, let's see, this one uh, for uints, I just did this uh, x value feed face. So when we dump that out, we should be able to reconstruct feed face. That's my, one of my favorite x values, feed face. Uh, float, I just did 1.2345. And then complex, I did 1.1 one uh, one plus 1i. One uh, I figured it would be nice to have the same value for both uh, components of the complex so that we can make sure that it's using the same representation. So let's run that. Uh, let's go up to the top here. So the integer, uh, sets. So uh, we did value negative one. It turned out it was two's complement, so we had all Fs. So that's uh, interesting, you know, to be expected, but uh, interesting nonetheless. Now we know a little bit more about how Go does things. Uh, uints, so you can see the value was speed face. Uh, printed out there as decimal, but the hex is speed face. And then when you look at the dump, you can kind of see the uh, endiness at play here. So feed face, because we read left to right, which is most significant to least significant, uh, you know, English, uh, left to right, uh, but it's represented here, uh, right to left, but in byte ordering, so the nibbles are reversed. So it's kind of hard to read, but you can see it there. Uh, float 64 is 64 bits, eight bytes. Um, I actually looked into it, and it's uh, the IEEE float 64 uh, format. And then complex, uh, you can see it's actually two, twice the size of 64-bit uh, values. So it's actually 128 bits, uh, which you would know from the type. Uh, but you can see it has, uh, we used one for both values, and it actually did use one for both places in memory. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, the other interesting thing is that uh, in this representation, uh, because of the way the floating points are represented, the bytes are on the right hand side. Um, I'm not really that great with float, uh, you know, bit representations, but that's how it represents one. So that's just kind of just uh, some background on the numeric types. Uh, let's skip over to array. This one as well is not terribly interesting. Uh, but basically, you just allocate a uh, size four array of n32s, populate with some values, dump it out. And indeed, it's kind of what you expect. Uh, you have the 32-bit values here, which are four bytes, going left to right, uh, least significant to most significant, and then they're just in sequence. It's pretty much what you expect. If it did anything else, you'd probably be worried. <laughs> so this is where we start getting interesting. So I was like, okay, well, I want to dump that a string. I want to see how strings are implemented. As you can see, there's null terminated uh, strings, Pascal strings are length prefix. There's like various different ways that you could opt into representing a string. So let's see what Go does. It doesn't do either of those, by the way. Spoiler. Uh, so we just initialize a string x here, declare initialize it. We uh, get the raw access to the uh, memory, and then we just dump it out. So that dumps it out. Okay, let's see here. Size of 16. 
Well, the string that I gave it was 15 characters long. To size of 16, that doesn't really match with the actual data that's representing. Uh, and then when we dump it out, we have uh, two 8-byte sequences here. Uh, so what could those be? Uh, my first thought is that the left-hand side looks kind of pointerish, so maybe it's pointed to somewhere else in memory. And then the right-hand side, 0f, like I know that value is actually the length of the string, 15. So that's most likely the length of the string. So if we go over here, uh, right here, all I'm doing is taking the first eight bytes, assigning it to a variable called first, second eight bytes, assigning it to a variable called second. And then here I'm using this uh, binary little endian. Uh, UNT64 uh, calls is built in the standard library as well to just convert that into a UNPTR uh, and then doing the same thing with length. Since length in Go is represented as an integer, I just converted it into an integer. And then I did the raw memory access. Instead of on the pointer to the string, I'm doing it on the data pointer that I read out of memory. Uh, so yeah, that's now this data memory slice and I dump that out here. So let's go ahead and do that. So indeed, that is actually where the data is located. You can see it's one byte shy of the 16 bytes, so that's correct. Uh, you can see uh, on the right-hand side the ASCII representation of the dump. It's indeed Hello Gophers. So that's pretty cool. Uh, let's see if we can mutate the string values. Um, I'm actually going to change the length by just assigning five. So this has uh, zero F now. So I'm gonna modify it to have the decimal value five and uh, dump it out. So that should truncate the, the string out from under go. Let's see if that works. So yeah, uh, instead of saying hello gophers now, the original string, which I didn't touch, I only touched the memory that it's pointing at. Uh, that original string, which was not mutated, is now saying hello, uh, which is pretty cool. Sorry, I didn't actually change the memory that I was pointing at. I changed the length in the string header. Uh, so Go represents uh, strings uh, using a pointer to where the data is in memory and a length. Uh, I actually tried mutating the string values. And if you use a const for your string, which is pretty much any string literal in the program is a const, uh, it puts the, that uh, string byte value uh, into a place in the binary that's read-only. It's under a section called uh, RO data, and you can't mutate that. Uh, so that's why I used the length as an example here. There's uh, some code in later uh, examples uh, right at the end of the talk that I have that allows you to actually read and write to read-only data. So uh, I'll get into that later. So we learned a little bit about how strings are represented in Go. I actually never ran across that representation. Uh, someone at the last meetup uh, uh, in Boulder uh, kind of uh, hinted that maybe uh, it maybe is implemented like that as an optimization. So copying strings are basically copying 16 bytes. So when you pass a string around, you're actually passing a pointer and a length, you're not passing the actual bytes of the string. Um, so that's. That may be uh, a reason why they put it that way. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely not something I ran into. So let's look at a slice. So we just uh, allocate the uh, slice here, the slice of n32s. Uh, the make function, if you're unaware, takes two arguments, the length of the slice and the capacity of the slice. And if you read up about slices at all, you, you understand like, the reason why a uh, slice has a capacity is the capacity is the length of the underlying array that backs the, uh, the slice. So uh, in this situation, we're allocating an array that's eight, eight uh, elements big, and each element is four bytes. So I append on just four values, so now our length is four instead of zero. And then I do the raw access stuff again, just to dump it out. So, let's see here. Uh, 
So yeah, the value is one, two, three, four. The size of is 24, which should be four times eight. No, that's not right. Okay, so this is the example. Uh, we're actually reading the slice header. So instead of having the actual underlying array, we have the header here. So there's three different uh, eight byte values. Uh, so each one of these represents like a different value. Similar to the string, uh, the left hand, the, the first one represents a pointer to the underlying data. The next one represents the length, which is four. Uh, and then the third one is the capacity, which is eight. So I'm going to do what I did kind of with the string and just dump out those values here. Uh, dump out the actual memory that's pointing to. And then when we run this, there it is. So this is what I was looking for before. Uh, we have the uh, four byte values just in a row here. So this is the underlying array. So on this example, I wanted to mutate the slice. Uh, so <clears throat> I actually changed the pointer that the uh, slice header is pointing at. So previously it's pointing at a capacity eight array that had the values one, two, three, four. So in this example, in order to mutate the slice, I'm going to change the pointer to point to a different array that I allocate. So I go ahead and allocate that array, just Y here. And then I use little endian put UN64, which actually allows you to write values into uh, into byte slices, um, so you can write a uint into a byte slice using a little onion. So if I go ahead and do that, I should have replaced the values now. So if you look at value for the mutated slice, it's now 5678. I never touched the slice, I just mutated the slice headers, and I was able to change the values. So again, kind of learning something about how Go represents slice. You might you might pick this up by reading documentation or blog posts, but actually looking at the memory, I think is really helpful because you get the actual bits and bytes of like how this thing's working. Okay, back to something that we were uh, discussing before: uh, struct alignment. So we had those two examples uh, using atomic package, Pandex on 32-bit architectures uh, for whatever reason. And uh, for some reason, on uh, 64-bit architectures, in situations where the fields are ordered incorrectly, we end up allocating more memory than we expect. So let's look at this example here. So in this case, I have two structs, one called unaligned, which uh, we saw before, ABC, where it's 32, 64, 32. And then aligned, which is 32, 32, 64. So I'm just going to instantiate those two. Uh, so unaligned first, I'm going to dump that up, and then instantiate the aligned, and then I'll dump that up. OK, so we see the first one unaligned. Well, the reason why it was taking up more memory is it actually took up an entire 64-bit block of memory to represent that 32-bit value. Uh, and then I put the 64-bit next to it, and then another 32-bit, which requires 64 bits as well. Whereas if we reorder the fields, we can actually compact it to where the two 32-bit values are in the same 64-bit place of memory, um, and then the 64-bit value just sits next to it. If we run this on a 32-bit architecture, So yeah, you see, saw what we saw kind of before. Again, uh, the alignment is not as important in this situation because uh, the 32-bit architecture doesn't require 64 bits for a 32-bit value. But you can see kind of why we're panicking that Tomix example. Uh, the 64-bit value is kind of crossing two 64-bit boundaries here. So you have the first 64, the first eight bytes. Uh, whereas in the bottom example, the 64-bit value has a whole 64-bit space to itself. So that's kind of what the documentation means by on 32-bit architectures, you want to be 64-bit aligned for 64-bit values. In this situation, we're 32-bit aligned for 64-bit value. 
So I think this kind of brings a little bit of clarity to why it's important to consider the ordering of your fields and the size of your values. Alright, so the last one here is the uh, type to nil interface. So I'm going to ask a raise of hands, like who here has ran into this issue where you uh, have an interface that is nil, but when you compare it to nil, it's not nil. Does anyone ran into that? Alright, so we got a few people. Uh, so this is something that uh, I certainly ran into many times, and it's a common thing that trips up a lot of Go users. And I always hear explanations saying like, although it is a common like thing that trips up users, the way that it's implemented, there's no other good like option for why it's. Uh, there's no good way of like changing the implementation to make that problem go away. Uh, without changing like uh, things in ways that you might not want to. So I, I kind of feel like dumping out the memory gives you a little bit of insight into that. So in this situation, we're going to dump a nil error. So uh, the first situation we have uh, just a var x error. So whenever you, uh, initial, whenever you declare a value in Go, it's your initialize. So that's going to have a nil value. Uh, we're then going to compare that to nil and see if that's nil. Uh, the other two cases that we have is a type nil error. So that's a function that returns a pointer to some error, but the value of that pointer is nil. Uh, the other function is error value, which returns, again, a pointer to some error, but it actually returns the actual value, you know, some zero value of that error. So type nil error, uh, we go ahead and dump that out as well, and we compare it to nil. I also use this uh, reflect value of x is nil, uh, just to see what that says, if it's nil or not. And finally, error value do the same thing. So if we run this, uh, the first one, x is equal to nil is true, which is what we expect. And if you look at the memory, everything is zeros. So in Go, when you compare something nil, you're comparing to see if it is zero. You're not comparing to see if it points to something that might have a zero value. So this situation, uh, comparing to nil, it comes out true. The other two situations, when you compare it to nil, it's false. Uh, the last situation, you kind of expect that because you're returning a, a zero value, um, but you're actually returning an instance. But this middle example, you're returning nil, but it actually is not nil. Uh, and you can see here why. The first eight bytes is actually pointing to the type of the error. So whenever you tell Go that a value has a certain type, it's going to preserve that information. And so this is how it preserves it. If it threw away that information, you would be losing data. You're telling Go to preserve it, it's going to preserve it. So it pre preserves it in this point. Uh, the right hand side of that middle value is all zeros. So that's the nil. So that's the value it's actually pointing at. So again, the first part is the type, the second part is the pointer to nil. Uh, pointer which is nil. Uh, and then uh, the last example is just a common case where you have type information, but you also have a pointer to a common value. So yeah, any questions about this? Uh, for the struct ordering one, the, uh, so you have like the 64 and 32 mix. When you compile it, shouldn't it be able to tell that it's going to take up too much, like more memory than it could? Yeah, so uh, you would think, and this is the thought that I had, is like, why doesn't Go just figure this out for me? Uh, well, one reason might be is if, if you are interrupting with C, and C has a specific memory layout of a, a, a value in memory, well, you want to be able to specify the ordering and the size of those values. Um, if Go is reorganizing the fields, uh, underneath you, uh, while in most situations most people don't care, in situations where you do care, you want to have that control. Okay. So go, I think, er, uh, errs on the side of giving the control versus making things entirely optimal uh, for the memory layout. That's a good question. Cool, thank you.
Uh, just to repeat the question in case it wasn't recorded, uh, why doesn't Go just reorder things uh, in memory for you? Uh, reorder the field, field values. Any other questions about maybe the interface stuff? Oh. All right, so that's it for my demos. All right. Uh, I have a little bit of an overtime slide here. Uh, I wrote uh, just a kind of a common a little wrapper around uh, some uh, syscalls that allow you to mutate read-only memory. I thought maybe that'd be interesting if someone wants to actually go through and like really modify memory. Uh, this function here, this will be on my GitHub. Uh, just call allow writes and that will actually find the page uh, that your pointer is pointing into and then pass that into the syscall so that you can have access to that memory. Write access to that memory. Uh, I don't have a demo of how to use that, but it's, you just call the thing and pass it to you. It's pretty straightforward. Alright, that's it. I uh, just want to say thanks to Rourke Van Der Peel. If I messed up his name, I apologize, but uh, he was the one that uh, wrote that monkey patching library, and it's really awesome code. Uh, be careful, but uh, definitely check it out. He also has a blog post explaining how he implemented it. Uh, if you're really into this stuff, like check out that blog post. He does really uh, a lot of awesome stuff. Uh, I might have missed it, but can you tell the difference of why the two structs in different sequences came up in different sizes? Uh, so the question was, why did the two structs come out to be different sizes? So I can kind of jump back over there and probably did a bad job explaining it. Let's see. So it, it's basically like when you tell Go field A, B, C, uh, it's going to represent those in the order that you gave it. Uh, so if you say A, B, C, and you say 32, 64, 32, it's going to represent those accordingly. In this situation, it can't put the 64-bit value uh, in a place where the 32-bit value is. The 32-bit value has to take up the entire 64 bits. And that's because I'm running on a 64 bit architecture. Uh, in situations where I run on a 32 bit architecture, it can kind of compress things down. And it came up to the same size. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's because the 32 bit ar architecture, it can align things to 32 bits. In this situation, it can only align things to 64 bits. So I don't know if that clarifies it at all. Uh, but I think if you want to pull down these examples and run them and play with them, I highly recommend doing that. Uh, the slides and all the code will be on uh, my GitHub page. Uh, but yeah, uh, you can just run things. If you're on a 64-bit machine, just run it. You go run. Uh, if you want to jump over to 32-bit, um, you just do go arch, which is uh, not that. <laughs> Go arch is equal to 386, and that'll cross compile to 386 and then run it. This is, 386 is a subset of 64-bit. Um, you can run 386 code, 64-bit uh, architecture. That's a good way I like testing it. Any other questions? All right, cool. That's all I got. Thanks. Okay, that's all we got. So. You can feel free to hang out in the chat for a little bit. There's a ton of pizza left over, so please take it home. And beer. Yeah. Are you going to take a whole box on me? I'm really, it's take it or it's not going to be So, oh, it's good. Well, I know if you take it, well. Should be a sense of this. Thank you. And then we'll move on over. It's, uh, 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 it's, u